But the last thing I wanted to cover quickly before we go into a uh, like the exercise lab portion um, is this thing called the Gestalt principles, which are like a semi-formal um, idea. It's by um, this guy Elijah Meeks, who still works, I believe, at Netflix as like a visualization engineer. He wrote a book on D3, um, all around good, great guy. And these things he didn't invent, but he formalized them in this, this pretty clear way. And what the Gestalt principles are, um, get at what some of you have picked up on. Um, this idea that there's some things that we can only encode through the relation of points and not through individual encodings. Um, so there's no way to really, with a single value in the Facebook, encode things like the first dot-com boom. It's hard to take a single value and say, this was the first dot-com boom, but with all of the points, the natural grouping makes people look and say, oh, around 1999, there was a dot-com boom. Um, so that's what these, these principles get at. They're kind of like a higher order encoding, um, and they come from the relation of points. In these two examples, some of the more clear ones, um, we have things like similarity. So if I uh, presented to you on your left this, um, this graphic at a circles, some are gray, some are red, some are rose, um, and I have to say um, the data is in X number of groups. The data naturally, let's say, has all of these types of categories. Let's say we're talking about car models or something. Um, and I asked you, how many car models does this plot represent on the left? What would you say? Four. Two. Who said four? <laughs> why did you say four? There's no wrong answers, but why did you say four? four rows of reds. All right, four rows of reds. Um, <laughs> two. Who said two? Why did you say two? Well, I'm assuming my interpretation is that um, the color represents the model of the car. So there's two colors. So very, probably most important lesson in visualization, if you don't tell your reader what things represent, they, in theory, will make up their own ideas about it. Since there's no legend, we don't know if it's for red rows, or if it's gray versus red, or, or what, what this means. So usually, hopefully, there's labels, there's legends. Um, but I would say two is probably the more common. Um, if I were to poll the class, most of the class, I would say, would probably say two. But that doesn't mean two is right. That just means this is an ambiguous visualization. Um, let's say I asked of you the same question with the right plot. If I said, how many car models is this right plot representing? Why would you say two? Well, what, I guess, what represents each of them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say the probably most general answer would be there's two groups of two. Yeah. There's red group, there's gray group, but then there's also left group and there's right group. And some cars can be in both. Um, so let's say this is electric <laughs> versus gas and foreign versus domestic. Um, you can imagine there's some electric cars that are foreign, some that are domestic and some gasoline cars that are foreign and domestic. Um, so again, these are two things that, or the Gestalt principles are alternative ways of representing relation groups, um, categories. 
And there's, if you go to the, the link, I guess I'll, I'll click on the link here. There's like seven-ish. Um, and again, these are usually things that when you see them, you know them and you identify them. Um, things like colors, proximity, how things group together. Um, there's also this idea of enclosure. So we saw that as a visual encoding. We can explicitly say, draw a box around it. Um, there, what's this one? Uh, yeah, there's a few. Some of these I don't didn't super work. Uh, but other ways to represent things as more than the sum of its parts. Another tool in your tool chest as someone who's visualizing things. And to wrap up, I just wanted to talk a little bit about process. And then we'll jump into um, a, little, a little group exercise. Um, so this is a process, I guess, um, formalism by Ben Fry, and this was his PhD thesis. Um, so PhD theses have actually some very practical impact in the field of visualization. Um, so this is from, from Ben Fry that came out, I want to say it was like around 2000s, like late 1990s. And in this, he basically broke up the process of how we approach getting and creating visualization, starting from raw raw data to begin with. Um, has anyone seen this before? Right, sometimes people um, analogize this to represent a lot of the aspects of just the data analysis process as a whole. Um, so the arrows here don't um, necessarily mean that there's these two things that go backwards. There's this one that goes forwards. Um, they represent the iterativeness of this. Um, so I didn't want to draw like eight arrows going from every stage to every other stage. But it's a very iterative process, making visualizations. Um, and I guess in, in this one, I, I like to extend it. Um, so in, in Ben Fry's, he has these four groups. He says there is one that kind of starts with the data munging. Um, so that's this first one that he labels computer science. This is acquiring data, parsing data. The second one is typically what we think of as like inference and analysis. And this is probably what most of everyone focuses on. It can be the hardest and has the most theory behind it. But um, if you had to say uh, what the majority of your classes as part of the masters fall into, would it be computer science? math and statistics, graphic design, or human-computer interaction. Raise your hand if you think most of the classes you have taken in this master's fall into computer science. How about math and statistics? All right, overwhelming majority. Graphic design, HCI. All right, so this is, this is my, my slight um, critique of the data educational ecosystem. Most people focus on the second part, math, statistics, inference, data mining, machine learning, all of the things that are typically like referred to as like the fun and interesting parts. Um, even though these other parts are just as, if not more important. Um, so I would say, the first part is probably what can make or break your entire analysis. If you don't acquire and validate your data and scrub your data and transform it, it doesn't matter how smart of a machine learning model you have. If it was built on bad biased data, it's going to give bad biased results. Um, so I would say if you did have to spend most of your time, I, I recommend people spend it in, in the first part. Um, this class is going to focus on the latter two. So you get two whole stages, um, but one class for it. Um, 
I said I'd like to adapt this a little bit. Um, so in, in my adaptation, I basically break it out to um, have one stage focus on just getting the data, one step on exploring the data. So the second one here, um, I say data transformation. The third one's the same, so analysis, evaluation, machine learning. And then the fourth one is what this class is all about, communication. Um, and I say, I, I, I like to make this distinction. A few other folks I've seen have, have made it as well between States maybe um, so hopefully some of you are doing one or both of these stages An interesting, but not what I intended. Um, but um, once you get all of that first stuff done, I think with data viz, what you're really wanting to do is communicate to the masses, and you want to do it succinctly and clearly. So you want to make sure your whatever you're putting out there is easy for people to read or interpret or interact with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess the 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 distinction. Both of you kind of got at it. Um, presentation, I would say here, is purely the visual representation. So this is what the majority of this class is going to focus on, is visual encodings, interaction, all of these things. Um, and I say dissemination is something that people don't necessarily think about, since it's the last step of the process. And this is how are you going to share and communicate broadly your results. And a practical example, um, I'm sure some of your capstones, probably most of your capstones are with a company. Um, you're not going to disseminate it publicly on a web page and try to get like the majority of people in the United States to look at it to convey this message. It's really only geared towards a small group, a small engineering team, maybe 10 people. Um, so how you disseminate the results of a project to an internal team of 10 people is very different than how you disseminate some result to, let's say, the US population at large. Um, the New York Times, talking about the election, needs to talk about the election in a way that the entire populace of the United States can interpret and access. Um, but if the New York Times was just communicating internally between its engineers some results of a prediction they made on who's going to win the primary. They may not need to package it up in the same way or lay it out visually in the same way even. Um, so presentation and dissemination are subtly slightly different. Um, and this is actually back to, to Ben Fry's. Um, the two, I guess there, there's maybe more ways to, to break this up, but the two main ones are this idea of exploratory visualizations and explanatory. Um, explanatory visualizations are what most people think of when they think of visualization. These are the beautiful New York Times D3 plots. But exploratory are just as important. And the distinction I like to make is that explorations are between you and your data. It's when you're asking these questions and saying, I don't know if Facebook had the biggest IPO in the last 10 years, but I want to know, so how am I going to visualize it so I can definitively figure out the answer to this question? Um, explanatory are, I figured out the answer to this question, and now I want to communicate it to people. Um, so when we get to um, more exploratory visualizations next week, we'll talk about why things work or why things might work for exploratory visualizations, but not for explanatory visualizations. Any, any questions on the process of it all? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll bring this slide back. Um,
Show of hands, people in their capstones. Are people in their capstones, um, let's say, people in the first stage, this uh, acquire and transform data? Who here is still doing that? Oh, yeah, practicum, capstone, project things. All right, who's in the data mining and machine learning stage? Who is, I guess just in general, who's doing a visualization component for their practicum? And who's visualizing things now? All right, cool. Um, kind of the distribution I expected, um, but yeah, so we'll talk about visualization in the context of this larger process, but we're pretty much only going to focus on the last section here in this class. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll end the lecture with another one of Tufty's quotes. Um, and it's kind of vague. He has all these like really vague but wise seeming quotes. Um, <laughs> Excellence in statistical graphics consists of complex ideas communicated with clarity, precision, and efficiency. Um, so the reason I put this up here is we talked about all these visual encodings. We talked about some things that are better at communicating other things, um, such as categorical versus order versus time. But at the end of the day, um, communicate the thesis of your visualization with as few visual encodings as possible. So just because you can double encode things with color and x-axis position doesn't mean you have to, doesn't mean you should. Um, so yeah, excellence um, is in the simplicity uh, when you're communicating these very complex things.